The Pell Center Prize for Story in the Public Square is awarded every year to that person whose work makes a difference. This year, we chose Hollywood screenwriter Danny Strong. A Hollywood actor, producer, and screenwriter, Danny first left his mark early in his career during five seasons as the character Jonathan Levinson in the hit show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He has since played roles in the TV series Mad Men, Grey's Anatomy, How I Met Your Mother, Seinfeld, and Gilmore Girls. Somewhere along the way, Danny started to write. And right he did. His 2008 HBO film Recount about the 2000 presidential election won a primetime Emmy. His Game Change, the 2012 HBO production about the 2008 presidential campaign, was nominated for 12 Emmy Awards and won for Best Movie and Miniseries. Danny personally won the Emmy for Outstanding Writing, a Golden Globe, a Writers Guild of America Award, a Peabody, and the Penn Award for the film. He wrote Lee Daniels' The Butler, one of the most socially relevant films of the past year, and he has written the two-part Mockingjay finale to The Hunger Games. Part one will be released this year, and part two is currently in production. On learning of the honor, uh, which we bestow on him today, Danny said, and I quote, it's never easy getting this kind of material produced, so honoring it is a public service of its own, as it will hopefully lead to more films and TV shows that examine the pressing social issues facing our country today. We couldn't agree more. And we are delighted to have this man who tells thought-provoking stories on a grand scale with us today. The Pell Center Prize for Story in the Public Square, presented to Danny Strong for distinguished storytelling that has enriched the public dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, Pell Center honoree, Danny Strong. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction, Jim. It was really lovely. And thank you, Sister Jane, for the award. This is, this is very exciting. And uh, Ian, congratulations to you on your fantastic movie. Maybe in a few years you'll be here accepting this award. You can just run the gamut of awards that they have here. <laughs> so it's a really, really great work. I was extremely impressed. So, Well, first off, let me just say um, how honored I am to be here to be accepting the Pell Center Prize for Story in the Public Square. Though, as I see many of you staring back at me expectantly, I realize I had better try. So let's get to the subject at hand, story. I've spent almost every day for the past two decades in pursuit of exactly that, story. Good story, bad story, sob stories, love stories. So to be given an award from an organization that celebrates storytelling in American culture and politics it's a wonderful reminder that all those years of pain, anguish, toil, and therapy have not been wasted. There are many ways in which the human race finds entertainment. Sports, board games, Instagram, Candy Crush. But what elevates story above these other diversions is a simple word, but a word that is, in my opinion, proof that we've entered our higher level of evolution. And that word is theme. Through a story's theme, the creator of the story is trying to express something about the human condition that enlightens, teaches, inspires, or reflects upon what it means to be a living human being. Theme is what makes story such a personal part of our lives. Theme makes the human race human. Now, I honestly believe that <laughs> what truly began the journey of the human race was the caveman or cavewoman's ability to create art. And I hope if this speech accomplishes anything, it's that I make the word cave woman part of <laughs> the cultural conscious. Um, it was the process of telling stories on the walls of caves that showed the troglodytes the need to reflect upon themselves beyond the desire for basic survival. So even back then, we had an innate sense of what a story can do. They can make us call a forgotten friend, tell a parent we love them, inspire us to fight for equal rights, or lead us on a path that we only dreamed of taking until we came across a story that propelled us to follow our bliss. I know this sounds kind of lofty, coming from someone best known for fighting vampires on a TV show about 10 years ago. Um, after all, I do work almost entirely inside the Hollywood studio system, which at its heart is a business trying to create profit through mainstream entertainment that will be purchased and watched by as many people as possible. But profit isn't a bad thing. And these stories, no matter how popular or populist, still have a theme at their center. 
So even with all the profit-minded product Hollywood puts out on a yearly basis, there's still 100 years worth of compelling and inspiring films, 65 years of TV shows, and 2,000 years of plays whose themes have changed the hearts and minds of millions of people. That's the power of a story well told. It can entertain while simultaneously shedding light on important issues to a mass audience in ways that no other medium can because a story creates an emotional experience. You know, it's one thing to just read about the plight of workers. It's quite another to watch Sally Field as Norma Ray hold up a sign that declares union. You know, tweets are all well and good, but film and TV shows have the ability to move more people than any other conduit of information because of the sheer volume of people that seek entertainment through story. You know, there was no greater platform for social causes in the 70s than Archie Bunker's couch. Platoon and Full Metal Jacket showed us the horrors of war. Girls and sex in the city empower women's professional and sexual independence. All the President's Men shines a light on government corruption. Milk propels forward the gay rights movement. Silver Linings Playbook explores mental illness. These movies and TV shows have all prompted a national discussion that I believe affected the conscious and subconscious mind of the nation. Now, I think there's no better example of this in recent times than the TV show Will and Grace. Through a charming sitcom, America became very close with Will and Jack, two gay men who could have been our brothers, uncles, cousins, and friends. Now, anyone who tuned in, and millions did, became normalized to gay men in a way that destigmatized homosexuality and its false and very condescending stereotypes. America got to experience gay men as everyday citizens, better dressed and wittier everyday citizens, but isn't everyone on TV better dressed and wittier? <laughs> now, Will and Grace didn't just entertain. It helped further a radical shift in the national acceptance of gay marriage. In 1998, the year Will and Grace first aired, 31% of the country supported gay marriage and 64% opposed it. Today, those numbers have flipped, with 57% supporting gay marriage and 36 opposed. Now, I'm not here to tell you that a, sing that a sitcom single-handedly did that, but the show played a part because it told a compelling story with a timely theme and an important message. Now, what was my will and grace? Well, that's easy. It was The Cosby, sh the Cosby Show, which was in the same way uh, that people who grew up watching Will and Grace most likely find current-day homophobia absurd, I learned quickly the absurdity of racism thanks to the antics of the Huxtable family. They were my friends. They were my friends' friends. Uh, we talked about Re Rudy and Theo on the playground as if we knew them. So when I was 10 years old, the idea that people could be discriminated against because of their race just didn't make any sense to me. And today, in 2014, it still does not. Now, another seminal event for me with story shaping my personal views was seeing the civil rights drama Mississippi Burning. I don't know if you remember this, but it's a story of uh, three civil rights workers that were killed in 1963 in the investigation to find uh, the men who did this to them. So I was only 14 years old at the time, but I'll never forget sitting in the theater and being utterly outraged at the events I was watching, revealing a legacy of cruel indignities to African Americans that instilled in me a deeper sense of right and wrong than any life event that had happened to me up until that point. Now, that film has been criticized over the years as an unfair representation of the civil rights movement because it's about two white FBI agents investigating the murder of three people, two of them being white. Now, the fact that for the last 30 years that that's the only uh, film about the civil rights movement, a movement that was predominantly defined by African Americans fighting for themselves, is certainly a shame. However, it does not mean that that story did not deserve to be told. And I'm sure there are millions of people like me who were deeply affected by it. Now, as you just heard, I wrote a movie called The Butler. And in my mind, you're all applauding right now. The, but the, the Butler, thank you. It doesn't count when I have to force you, but that's all right. I'll still, I'll still take it. Um, now, when it came out, I was constantly asked about the fact that as a white male, how was I able to write African Americans? Uh, that's a perfectly fair question, but as a writer, I feel like I have a perfect answer, which is, I'm a writer. That's, that's like what we do, right? We, all I do as a writer is I write characters who are not me. 
characters of different races, genders, political persuasions, religious leanings, sometimes even species, characters that have nothing in common with my own life experience. Um, this is the craft I have chosen to partake in, and it's called writing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> basically. Now, a much more interesting question that I was never asked, which is, why did I want to write a film about the history of the civil rights movement? The answer comes from my experience researching the HBO film Recount, which was the story of the Florida Recount. As you can see, I'm like really good at titles, right? Recount, the butler. Uh, right now I'm writing uh, a remake of Guys and Dolls, which I'm calling Guys and Dolls. Um, now, while knee deep in researching hanging chads and the antics of Katherine Harris, which as many of you know were pretty wacky antics, I was shocked to discover the appalling and devious manner in which African-American voters were suppressed in the state of Florida during the 2000 election. As the film portrays, the Division of Elections had a voter purge list made up of names of felons who, in accordance with Florida state law, are not allowed to vote. However, the company that was commissioned to create the list was instructed by the Division of Elections to, quote, cast as wide a net as possible. To do that, they didn't just list felons. They listed anyone whose name was similar to a felon. Well, you can imagine the result. Thousands of people were purged from the voter rolls whose only crime was having a name similar to a felon. Now, because the number of felons in the state of Florida are disproportionately African American, the maneuver had in effect, and in my opinion, the attendant effect, of purging a disproportionate number of African Americans who voted 90% Democratic in the state of Florida. This was, in my opinion, a devious modern day Jim Crow tactic. Now, after the voter purge list became public, the NAACP sued the state of Florida, and in the settlement, 20,000 names that had been incorrectly placed on the list were to be placed back on the voter rolls. 20,000 names. 44% of those names were African American. So here are two facts, and I'll let you decide if they're related. It's kind of a loaded thing I just said, but regardless. <laughs> Almost 9,000 African Americans were illegally purged from the voter rolls in Florida before the 2000 election. George W. Bush won the 2000 election because he won Florida by 537 votes. It's interesting math, isn't it? Now, perhaps I was incredibly naive, but the fact that Jim Crow tactics were still alive and well and so flagrant just completely blew my mind. Stunned and angered, I decided that as a writer, I wanted to focus my next script on the history of race in America. I felt that if there was a more visceral understanding of the struggle for equality, if I could shine a light on our dark racial history, it could potentially make some people, and I had no idea how many for me too was good enough, uh, less willing to stand by and more willing to stand up to what I considered a grave injustice. I also felt that the lack of films on the subject was a failure on the part of the artists and the filmmakers who I believe have a responsibility to comment on and attack social injustice. So, the first script I wrote after Recount was the story of Brown versus the School Board of Education. To me, Thurgood Marshall's struggle to win an unwinnable case in a unanimous decision to legally end segregation in America was just a moving, triumphant, and important American story. Now, if you haven't seen it, don't feel bad. It's because it doesn't exist. The film was never made. So here's an ugly fact about Hollywood. Movies with African-American protagonists are very difficult to get financing. This is because for the last 20 years, a large portion of how films are financed comes from foreign pre-sales, and it is hard to raise money in foreign territories for black-themed movies, which is a stark reminder that racism is not just an American problem. This is the primary reason why there have been so few black mainstream film and TV shows for the last 20 years. They're less profitable overseas. If you remember in the 80s and the 70s, there was all sorts of programming like this. And now that foreign financing and revenue from foreign markets is so significant, it has drastically reduced the number of African-American themed films that have been made. So thus, my Thurgood Marshall script ends up on a pile of other scripts. Now, a year after I finished that script, the legendary producer, Laura Ziskin, 
brought me a Washington Pro Post profile about a White House butler. I knew from my last experience that it would be almost impossible to get this film made, but I also knew that I was as passionate as ever to tell a story about the civil rights movement. So I thought, well, let's just try again. The article was a beautiful profile written by Will Haygood about the gentle and kind butler, Eugene Allen. Although I was deeply moved by Mr. Allen, I had no idea how I was going to turn his story into a movie. It had many strikes against it, not the least of which that the lead character's primary goal in life is to be invisible when he's in a room, which is not exactly your typical movie fare. <laughs> but I believe there was something special in Mr. Allen's story. Now, the breakthrough for me came when I was researching civil rights battles. I was reading about the sit-ins, the Freedom Riders, Selma, and as I read about these dramatic events, I kept thinking that I wish the film could take place at these battles instead of at the White House all the time. But I needed a reason to do that. I needed a reason to find a way to get the movie to take place in the streets of Selma. So I did something really crazy. I made a reason up. I wrote one. For you budding writers out there, this is a primary example of how the writing process works. The solution to your problems end up being what makes the story work. But you first have to figure out what the problem is in order to figure out that you even need a solution. Now, in this case, I gave the butler a son who was a civil rights activist. That way, we can have scenes take place during the civil rights battles, and when we're in the White House, we can see the president grapple with the issues of civil rights. Now, I hope this would turn the butler's silence in those scenes into moving and powerful scenes, because every offhand comment or presidential decree would affect the butler's own son. So to tell the true story of the vast civil rights movement, I had to tell a fictional story about a father and his son. And this is the reason why I changed the name of the character from Eugene Allen to Cecil Gaines. I thought this was the clearest way I could say this is not Eugene Allen's real story because the character's name isn't Eugene Allen. Get it, right? I thought that was kind of obvious when I did it, but. Uh, I certainly got attacked for it from time to time, as there was occasional criticism of the film for this narrative device. But this criticism meant nothing to me because I had no movie without this device. I didn't have a story. Now, as with the Thurgood Marshall script, it looked like it was going to be impossible to get this movie made. Lee Daniels, Forrest Whitaker, and Oprah Winfrey attached themselves to the project very quickly, and yet every single financer in Hollywood, every single one would not finance the film. The answer was always the same. We love the script, we love the project. Lee Daniels is the perfect director who had just come off his Oscar nomination for Precious. Uh, but the foreign numbers don't add up. That phrase became my nightmare. The foreign numbers don't add up. So Lee and I, both <laughs> very depressed because we thought we've got Oprah. <laughs> Can't we get the movie made? We've got Oprah. But nonetheless, the answer was, the foreign numbers don't add up. So we both moved on to our next projects. And um, Laura Ziskin, our producer, who was battling cancer, and her producing partner, Pam Williams, continued to try to raise money for the film. So what Laura did was she started calling wealthy African Americans who had never invested in movies, had nothing to do with the movie business, asking them to invest in the movie, trying to mirror the narrative of the film, which was African Americans standing up for themselves. During this process, she eventually succumbed to her disease after having created Stand Up to Cancer. And in her will, she left enough money to keep her company open for two years. Sorry, I always get emotional when I talk about this. She left enough money in her will to keep her company open so that the, mo the movie could get made. And I know, isn't that amazing? Um, and Pam Williams, her uh, beloved producing partner, uh, spent the next two years banging down every door she could, and she got the money. And we went into production, and this is what it took to get this type of movie made. This is what it took to tell this kind of story. It would have been a lot easier if the butler had a superhero cape and a mask and fought crime. Um, the passion and dedication to tell these types of stories that are being honored today is very difficult. 
And the Pell Center is providing a great service to shine a light on these kinds of stories. Now, as many of you know, the film has been a huge success. Financially, it was a huge hit. So to all those Hollywood financiers, I just want to say, na 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 <laughs> But the real triumph has not been the domestic box office for the butler, which was amazing. We made over $100 million. The real triumph was the foreign grosses. Remember that the foreign numbers just don't add up? So internationally, the film has made $65 million, a number that has stunned foreign financiers. And even more stunning is the international grosses for the film 12 Years a Slave, another film that struggled to raise financing because of lack of interest in black themed stories. And the only reason why it ultimately got financed was because Brad Pitt played a very small part in it. So Brad Pitt did that to get the movie made. That film has grossed a whopping $121 million internationally. Now, both of these films are breaking wide open the business model of international sales of black films. And their, their worldwide success will bring these important stories to children all over the world. So hopefully shaping their outlook on race in the same way Mississippi Burning and The Cosby Show defined mine. So before I conclude, which I promise will be shortly, I want to say a few words about something even a thousand words can't capture, the creative process itself. Now to those of you who are curious how I went from TV character actor playing teen nerds and neurotics to the recipient of the Pell Award for Story in the public square, the answer is very simple. I just sat down and I just wrote a lot about stuff far outside my wheelhouse, material that is way out of the league of my own personal uh, life experiences. Now, one perk of being a writer is that you don't need a resume. And if you looked at my resume, you'd see I have, I have no professional background in politics, law, or journalism. All I have is a BA in theater and a PhD in passion. I was just excited about these stories, usually on a subject I was intrigued by or angry about, and then I would research it, and I would research it, and I'd keep researching until I was sick of researching, and that's when I would start writing. Many uh, writers in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. So I wrote my first script when I was 26, three years into a moderately successful acting career, and over the next few years, I got to the point where I would write almost every day for about four hours, and it became my therapy to get my mind off the constant rejection of my acting career, because there's a lot of rejection in an acting career. I was writing broad comedies because I thought this would give me the best shot at breaking into the screenwriting business. And after five years and several scripts later, I was unable to sell a script. So five years got me nothing. And I asked myself, what am I doing wrong? How have I screwed up these last five years? And one night, feeling pretty depressed, having a little pity party, woe is me, I looked at the shelf on my wall and I saw the problem. A pile of scripts I had written that I would never go see. I decided the next script I was going to write was going to be something I was passionate about, a movie I would be excited to see. And several months went by without me writing a word, as many writers in the room know what I'm talking about, until I saw a play by the great playwright David Hare called Stuff Happens. And the play was about the buildup to the Iraq War. And I was so inspired by David Hare's story that as soon as the play ended, I immediately decided I was going to write a political drama in the vein of Stuff Happens. And literally 30 seconds after I decided that, the idea of the mo of, for a movie about the Florida recount popped into my head. And when I say 30 seconds, I mean 30 seconds. I, I remember where I was standing. It was right outside the exit door of the theater. I knew the idea was unsellable to Hollywood, who at the time, and still is, completely adverse to political type movies. However, I was so convinced that my Florida recount movie was a good idea, I pursued it even though my agent and manager told me it would never sell. I just felt that the story needed to be told. Lo and behold, HBO felt the same way and bought the pitch. I was, and to this day, am stunned that HBO took a chance on me by giving me my first paid writing job. Writing the script was a profound experience as I was doing interviews with prominent politicians, scholars, and lawyers who I prayed didn't notice that I literally had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and that's accurate. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just flying by the seat of my pants. 
Um, it was exhilarating. It was terrifying. But I was always convinced that this story of the Florida recount needed to be told. So that's my story for now. I continue to write about politics, history, social injustice, because I'm passionate about them and feel that this passion can translate into movies and TV shows that are not only important, but also entertaining. I still write between four to five hours a day, almost every day, and I truly think I'm as unlikely as anyone I know to be commenting on issues of national politics, race, and class to millions of people. And having watched this speech, you're probably all thinking the same thing. <laughs> um, I know that many people here have stories inside of them that they're desperate to tell, but are nervous about pursuing the craft of writing. But I say if you have the passion, the drive, the discipline to write every day, and stories of your own, whether it be as a novelist, a journalist, or perhaps a screenwriter, the pursuit of theme through story is what makes the world a better place, in my opinion. And who knows what 14-year-old's life you can change with your stories as he waits to sneak into some R-rated movie his father didn't approve of. So that's my plea to all you future writers. Tell your stories, put pen to paper, and just show the world what you got. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And to learn more about Story in the Public Square, please visit publicstory.org. We look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>